Good morning and welcome to 23 Degrees Sideways. In the last video we talked a little bit about living aboard and what it takes to live aboard and how the idea and the concept comes out of, out of <clears throat> advancements in yachting and over the course of time and how people have, you know, traditionally when you get to that live aboard lifestyle, when it becomes something that people write about and design boats for, after World War II, usually you're talking about after World War II, the sizes get really big and the, the things that people think of as necessary get really big. And there's nothing wrong with thinking about that because you have to make such huge adjustments to live aboard in any, any situation. Now, obviously, if you have a 90-foot boat with a crew and crew quarters, then... Um, you know, you're in, a, you're in a different situation. You're in a different kind of world. And you probably, even while you might live on the boat more or less full time, you probably have three or four vacation houses to go with that. A 90-foot motor yacht with a crew is not a low-income endeavor. Now, going all the way to the other extreme on the bohemian side, and that you know, there's there's three or four categories on this other extreme, on this low-budget extreme. There are people who are functionally homeless and live on a floating wreck and have, whatever, substance abuse issues, life, life integration issues, whatever it may be, and they can be very happy, probably not with substance abuse issues, but life integration issues can just be, you know, troll under the bridge, enlightened and happy. Um... Or, you know, they can be very unhappy. They can be in a huge condition of stress and need. A bad, mentally hygienic life. Everything is, is stress. They're always afraid of losing the boat. They're always afraid of not eating dinner. They're, there's just there's not enough money. There's just stress, stress, stress. And you can feel that sometimes and if you're on a fixed income or a limited income, no matter what your situation is. I cannot believe I have a problem with jet noise over here. I haven't had that problem in years since I lived under an airbase. But there's a Navy jet flying no nearby. So, you know, on, on other types of bohemian, there's people who just are nomadic, live with lower incomes deliberately, you know. They, they want to live a life and not work a life. Uh... People who want to, you know, save. There are people who are out doing nomad life because if you do it right, you can do it very inexpensively and save a lot of money. Especially if you work, you know, seasonal jobs or something and your your cost of living every month is under a thousand dollars. It's not not really hard to get ahead if you've got a lot of what whatever financial discipline or no desire to get things or go out to the movies or go out to eat or whatever or controllable desires whatever it is so as as the history comes out of this you you get you you get people trying to put everything onto a mid-sized 50 foot boat washer and dryer full kitchen you know the idea is that you need to have the oven you need to have the four burner stove you need to have a full kitchen to do holiday meals and stuff because you're living aboard. There's there's this pattern of life that you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have a living room and a bedroom. You're supposed to have a certain number and type and quality of electric lights. You're just different things, different stuff. And you don't necessarily need all of that. And depending on how you how you choose to live, you can live much smaller <clears throat> with some, not compromises, but some ideological changes. I'm just going to say ideological changes because it's not ideology in the political sense, but it's ideology in the life sense. And an example of that, um, the you know the washer and dryer, it's kind of accepted as a middle-class norm that you should have your own washer and dryer. And I did a video on how to make a cruiser's washer, a nomad's washer, 
recently, last week. You can go look it up. It's it's a five gallon bucket with a plunger. Don't use a used plunger. Duh. Also, drill a hole in the plunger. I've got to update the video. I forgot a few parts that actually help. So, you know, the washer and dryer is a standard middle class thing. Kind of like you're supposed to have a microwave. You're supposed to have a Mr. Coffee coffee maker or something like that. A Keurig, whatever. You're supposed to have an oven and you're supposed to have multiple burners on your stove. This is just assumed stuff. You're also supposed to have pressurized water. This is all assumed stuff and your liveaboard has to be big enough to accommodate all of that stuff and a full-size refrigerator or most people won't think of it as survivable as a liveaboard. Now you get into van life and campers and people who live full-time in RVs and some of this stuff gets a little different, you know. Um, or you just look at regular urban America. Not everyone has a washing machine. Having Going out and doing your laundry or having your laundry done, dropping it off and picking it up, is, it's not an uncommon thing. This isn't, you know, it, it's it, the norm of middle-class suburbia isn't always the norm of the world, even the norm of America. So that washing machine, that's, that's a really big factor. Uh, and the dryer, because Americans are addicted to dryers. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I, I can see it. Uh, the washing machine is actually not having to go off and sit in a laundromat is, is really nice. On the other hand, it's not really that expensive to have your laundry done if you're in a situation where you can come back and pick it up you may not be if you're if you're a cruiser so you know these things vary a little bit one reason why people come up with creative washing ideas when they're on a boat microwaves coffee makers multiple burner stoves with ovens all of this stuff is not really necessary it's a lifestyle choice and if the, if the difference is between you being able to live comfortably on a boat and your cooking style is a grill on the rail in the cockpit, outside grill, and a single burner stove versus not being able to live on a boat because you need to have an oven, man, I don't know, maybe you don't need an oven, you know? You know, none of this stuff is, is natural law. You know, we didn't evolve or come spring full grown out of the forehead of a god with an oven in our hands. You don't need that. So you have to, you have to examine this. And when you start to get past that stage of we must have a 50-foot boat to have everything that goes in a house fit and all the complexity of systems... Once you get past that, there, it's, it's kind of a, there's a Pandora's box of what you don't need that comes out. And it turns out that there's a lot you don't need. You don't need nearly as much wiring and lighting as you thought you did. You know, for example, there's, there, there's a lot of stuff that just goes away. The microwave, man, I just never, I never really got the microwave. I, I never wanted to cook with one. You know, the instant meals are expensive and crappy. Like, there's just... If, if you want a five-minute meal, you can make an honest five-minute meal out of ingredients, even out of the freezer, much more easily. Hey, look at that. Construction barge. There you go. Life on the water. You can make a five-minute meal much more easily on a pan than fussing around with a microwave and poking holes and turning and flipping and all the little things that you're supposed to do to make the microwave meal turn out right. So microwave's not, not really a big deal. If you drink coffee, you can get coffee any number of ways on your stove, cold brew, little machine, little appliance machines, stovetop coffee, uh, espresso makers. There's, there's an, any number of ways to do this. You know, you watch Roger Barnes. He goes and he does voyages on a dinghy. Like... We're talking 16-foot, 18-foot dinghy, and he will go out for weeks. He's living on this dinghy. 
going around Europe. Of course, he has a house. He has his architecture business. He's, he's you know, he's not a full-time liveaboard. This is a key element. But, you know, his coffee is a little mocha pot. And, that, and he doesn't measure and tamp and do all the fancy stuff. He just puts the grounds in there, puts it together, and goes. And that's what he does. And it works perfectly fine for him. So... You can, you can do it without all of the stuff. And this goes all the way down the line. How much clothing you have, clothing storage, all of the stuff. It goes all the way down the line. What you actually need may or may not be what you think you need. And you have, you have to evaluate that. You have to reduce that to get yourself onto a 28-foot boat. I'm saying 28 foot just because I'm sitting in front of the abandoned Aloha that I would really love. I would trade everything for this boat in decent condition because it's just made as a cruising boat. Um, and it's got it's got a mast that can come down for the canal system, like it's designed that way. It's just it's a it's a great boat. Um, it's 28 feet, and we would be more comfortable on that than we are on our 34 foot boat just by design just the way the thing is designed it's designed for a for a small group of people to cruise on not as a racer you know compromises you get what you can afford and then you remodel it just like a house um it's actually not that much different chainsaw plywood paint you know Sometimes you've got to do fiberglass work, which is just coatings on the on the plywood. It's not that big a deal. Okay, so when you when you get down and you start reducing the square footage, the length of the boat, you're also reducing the operating costs, and that reduces everything else, which gives you more time to do other stuff. A lot of people, and just this is just how it is. A lot of people who live on their boats, who cruise on their boats spend months out of the year away from their boats okay possibly the the most common uh retired liveaboard situation i see for people who don't want to cruise the bahamas and the caribbean and go around the world but for people who are who are pretty much staying in the coastal u.s waters the most common successful middle class budget um, high budget, me medium to high budget situation I see is people who have something like a road trek or other, or a sprinter RV, some sort of mid-sized RV and a boat. And they spend the seasons wherever it's appropriate. Like they, they will spend the summer cruising New England and then they'll go drive out to the Rockies or whatever. You know, they'll 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 go back and forth and they'll spend some months out of the year <clears throat> in a in a vehicle. You know, we have a small van, and it's too small to do that full time with three people. You know, because there's three people involved right now, and the the van just isn't adequate for that. The van would be fine for two of us, and it would work out very well on the west coast or west of the Mississippi in general, mostly west of the Rockies, just because you can park, you can you can do the stuff. It's very hard to park in the east, eastern part of the U.S. because there's basically everything is private and everything is regulated. And I mean, you, you, you go to some places and the rest areas, the rest stops close at 6 or 9 p.m. and you're not even allowed to pee in the rest stop. It's like, well, forget about parking overnight and sleeping, you know, for one night, which just doesn't seem that big a deal. Um, you can't even use the bathroom. <clears throat> so that's a little weird. <sighs> Tangent, distraction, not the topic. Nonetheless, a lot of people will, will spend a lot of time off of their boat. The smaller the boat, the easier the boat is to maintain financially. The more freedom you have to go do stuff, go camping, go take the van off for two weeks for, for a road trip, um, you know, go fly out to see family. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes with this. 
that isn't on the boat doesn't mean that you don't live on the boat. Doesn't mean you don't love your boat. Doesn't mean you don't love cruising your boat. It just means that your life is free, as in freedom. And that's kind of the point of being a liveaboard. Unless, unless the goal of the liveaboard is to have a fiberglass tent because you're homeless. And that's fine too. More power to you. I will help you any way I can if that's where you're at, you know? Um, I've helped people plug holes in boats and, you know, do a basic wash down and, and tell them, you know, look, you, you got to sell these sails because you're never going to sail. Here's how you take them off. There, you just made $300, you know, whatever. Um, back to it. The size of the boat goes down. What you can do goes down. Now, there's a lot of stuff about that that is different. There's a lot of stuff about that that is different than it used to be. Because the power systems are smaller, you've got better batteries, you've got better um, power engine choices, you've got better rigging choices. You know, if you want to sail at the level of a late 19th century yacht, you can put a lot of stuff on your little sailboat because if the efficiency has and materials have gotten so much better that you can lose efficiency and still be better off, if that makes sense. For most people, it doesn't. Um, it, it's, a prob it's, it's, a, it's a social context problem, contextual problem in our civilization. So, you know, and a lot of systems, like, you can get, if your boat's set up for it right, and you have the power, you can get a little emerald air fryer, convection oven, toaster oven, regular oven, with a small grill plate on top, and it's all one unit, and it's the size of a counter microwave from the, from the 90s, from the early 90s, like, and if you've got the space for that, that does everything you need, literally everything you need, because you can even fry food in a little cast iron pan, like, that's great, as long as you don't require, you know, a blooming onion appetizer and three, um, whatever, TGI Friday's main dishes for a meal. You know, if, you, if you're eating at a reasonable level, it's perfectly adequate. So that, that's another thing to consider. Um, so, excuse the whistle. That's about that. You know, everything's gotten smaller, so it's easier to do, but you have to really think of your life as a little nomadic, you have to start opening that Pandora's box of what can you do without. And then it becomes an adventure of freedom. And remember that you're not locked into the boat. Your, your lifestyle has just opened up and become more free. And there's nothing wrong with leaving the boat for months at a time. The whole point is you've 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 got the boat you've got you've you've put yourself in that situation where everything is easier you know there's stuff you can do to prepare the boat for going away and we'll talk about that sometime you know corks and bungs and through holes and rain covers and all sorts of stuff and people to help watch it and marinas but we'll talk about that later in the meantime uh enjoy your coffee stay sideways and we'll see you next time